So we'll start the online event and we are joined in addition to this rather uh, impressive group also by more than, I don't know, 200 people online who are uh, tuning in from Ukraine and other capitals and also are one of our speakers there in Kiev. So our event today is on the record. We will be uh, recording it. So just for the sake of quality of the sound, if you could please limit the drinks and cookie noises. <laughs> Apologies for that because we will then share the video uh, widely with the within our network. Um, this event is available also in Ukrainian. Кому потрібно переклад, хто до нас підключається з України, просто вибрати в Zoom опцію. We have a, an amazing interpreter, Irina, with us to help us. We will also be taking uh, questions in the Q&A chat because this event is structured as a webinar, but we'll try to bring in voices from inside the room and outside of the room. So why we are convening this uh, research roundtable? Uh, it is, uh, the goal of it is actually to look at how we can strengthen the contribution of non-state actors. Mainly today we are talking about civil society and communities in the recovery of Ukraine. Uh, this is a deep dive beyond the principles because there have been uh, since uh, last year, quite a lot of a discussion about uh, inclusion, about the need to uh, have participatory democracy in place, uh, about the uh, importance of decentralization as something that actually makes Ukraine resilient. But up to now, uh, our understanding is that we have not really moved very much uh, in setting up specific instruments, frameworks, or algorithm, if you want, of how actually civil society can engage. And by civil society, I mean more broadly uh, community organizations, uh, condominiums, uh, NGOs, watchdog groups, investigative reporters, voluntary groups, both registered and non-registered, because as you all perfectly know, Ukraine has an amazing energy and agency uh, of its citizens. We were just thinking how to translate the word agency into Ukrainian. And I'm sure Irina uh, is doing a great job, but we were thinking of subjectness as something where citizens have this uh, power, uh, power not only to comply and to consume whatever services uh, the state provides, but um, beyond um, this compliance, uh, ability to shape, ability to fund, ability to produce uh, this kind of recovery we are talking about. Uh, and I'm joined by a fantastic group of um, experts today. Um, and uh, in here we have uh, Irina Yermolenko, who is the advisor to the mayor of Routine and the representative of the Association of Ukrainian Cities. Uh, to my left, uh, we have Olena Halushka, who is the co-founder of the Warsaw-based, but Ukraine-led International Center for Ukrainian Victory. She's more known to many of us as uh, anti-corruption activist uh, with the, with the Anti-Corruption Action Center that was doing an amazing job all the way from the Revolution of Dignity and before in actually uprooting uh, corruption in Ukraine and ensuring that government is accountable. And last but not least is Ina Bibluska. She will actually kick us off. She's joining us straight from Kiev. She is the deputy executive director of the International Renaissance Foundation, also known as Soros Foundation, a private foundation, Open Society Foundation, where um, is one of the largest players in Ukraine in supporting civil society from the grassroots, Inna has been in the sector since the 90s, also leading an independent think tanks, but involved in a variety of initiatives and has a real wealth of practical knowledge about what it takes for civil society and government to work together. So without further ado, I would like to turn the floor to Inna to uh, kick us off with the, what I ask the main question is why? Why do we need uh, a civil society and communities involved? What is the current state of affairs? And uh, how can we expand on that and develop cooperation? Ina, over to you. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Orissa. It's a privilege to be here and uh, uh, join this conversation about why and how. Really, very good questions. So, I will try to focus on these two things. So, uh, 
why meaningful engagement is crucial and meaningful is probably the key word and then how we can do that and what is already happening and how we are contributing as a private philanthropy but also as part of the ukrainian civil society uh, so it's been exactly a year since uh, uh Ukraine began to turn the tide in Russia's war of aggression when it pushed away uh, the Russian occupiers from outside Kyiv, uh, from, from Irpin, we probably will hear, hear more about that, but that's exactly a year since the civil society and the government and the international partners started talking seriously about how Ukraine will be uh, going through the reconstruction and achieve eventual recovery. And civil society has been at the forefront of both providing the rapid emergency response, saving Ukrainians, helping to do whatever it takes for Ukraine to prevail, uh, but also participate in the planning and thinking forward. So uh, why, why does this matter? Uh, well, first, Ukrainians want to be engaged. If you look at all the polls, you will say that the huge proportion of Ukrainians think that they have a role to play. There was a recent poll done by National uh, Democratic Institute and showed that 98% uh, like of Ukrainians believe that reconstruction and recovery should be transparent and accountable. About the same number uh, think that it should be sustainable and also like 92% of Ukrainians say that it should be inclusive of all citizens. So there's no way Ukrainians will uh, be excluded. Uh, they want to co-create, they want to co-implement, co-own the recovery. And there is the whole new cohort of extended civil society. And here I agree with Orisa, we are not talking just about civil society organizations, but the whole wide extended active so civil society wants to participate and lead uh, where they can make a difference. So for civil society, the recovery is kind of a new social contract, which reflects their demand for the new relationships between within the society, between the society and the government, the new relationships of accountability in a society where there will be no return to the pre-war challenges to corruption, embezzlement, and poor governance. So there is a lot of added value in the civil society energy, and this is a great resource which is already in place and uh, which can be used for the most outstanding experience of participation for Ukrainians, which will eventually transform the country, complete its transformation into a successful and prosperous European nation governed by the rule of law. And leaving people out of this process would undermine trust, it would undermine the social cohesion and increase the conflict potential in the society which is already traumatized by the war. So the second point, why, is that civil society is actually already participating. Uh, it has its resources, it has donors' resources, it's got the skills, it's got the voice and connections to engage. It is building the cross-sectoral platforms for designing visions, for planning specific interventions, for creating project design offices, for adapting the learning from the decentralization and indeed that was a great experience and one of the most successful reforms which uh, has provided Ukrainians with local democracy and participation instruments, with participatory budgeting tools, with understanding what accountability means and also with skills to build other people's skills and have more people on board in this process. The relationship between the government and the civil society in the recovery process has been, let's say, mixed. So there has been uh, the National Council for Recovery of Ukraine uh, set up almost a year ago and civil society was not invited there to be part of the governance and policy level but it has participated a lot in dozens of working groups and conversations about specific things which then informed the recovery planning and the resulting national 
recovery plan, which was presented in Lugano last summer, although it was not a project of a structured systemic stakeholder consultations, it did raise some very important issues. It was ambitious, but short on details and on the implementation mechanisms. And it left a lot of room for stakeholder engagement and uh, for designing how these uh, mechanisms uh, will work. So the civil society did challenge uh, the lack of engagement with producing its own comprehensive document, which is known as Ukraine after victory and imagining Ukraine in 2030. And it focused on values, on democratic institutions, on governance and rule of law, on how the humanitarian and economic development policies can work for the people, how the hard recovery links with the soft people's issues of education, uh, health, essential services, culture, and local self-governance. In the run-up to Lugano, over 200 civil society organizations produced and endorsed what is known and was presented in Lugano as the Civil Society Manifesto 2022, also known as the Lugano Declaration. There was an official Lugano Declaration, and many of the guiding principles uh, were actually the same, and these were the principles of participation, accountability, ownership, and inclusion. So there have been a number of examples, which probably we will discuss further. Um, uh, but just to name you a few, where the government's collaboration with the civil society was quite effective. The one which comes to mind is uh, the work of the RISE coalition of a couple of dozen of civil society organizations. And uh, the product they are working on together with the government's counter uh, counterparts in the government is the digital reconstruction management system. There are other products which are look into how civil society contribute to economic resilience and these uh, include uh, uh, things like uh, guarantees in, uh, for investors, uh, sanctions, energy security, debt relief, many specific and difficult things. So there are areas where civil society participation and impact is particularly strong and this is Examples are reintegration of war veterans, psychosocial support to bereaved families, promoting access to education and essential services at the community level, creating the community-based solutions for internally displaced people, advancing gender equity and inclusion, advocating for green recovery, uh, promoting social innovations, and many more. Until recently, a lot of conversations about the recovery and reconstruction have been limited to the international and national level and they represented few voices from the local economic development and the decentralized self-governance this needs to change and it's already changing and it's not really about the seat at the table but it's about making sure that recovery works for the people and is done by the people who can handle it locally with their own resources and feed into this overall national wide recovery effort. So uh, civil society has also the knowledge and expertise and its own networks to address some of the difficult issues, including those for which civil society is probably uh, better positioned and more flexible uh, to go upfront and talk about some issues uh, that really need a lot of debate before they go to be handled by the governments and uh, the international institutions. So civil society is also the key driver of this principle of building back better. We will be hearing about that, but it's also the principle of building inclusively, building forward, meaning that it is proactive and innovative and also building green and trying to see how the interests of different stakeholders, the government, local self-governance, uh, the society, investors, international partners, and the environment actually meet and create these new longer term opportunities. And finally, as I mentioned, this is also the possibility to link hard infrastructure reconstruction with a soft so to say human centric recovery and eventually resolve this tension between the two approaches like 
wrapping building uh, along the term development path, which also is, uh, focuses on sustainability, on human centric uh, contributions, on climate protection, on social justice, on inclusion, and eventually uh, pushing Ukraine forward towards its European future. We understand this all will take long time, and all this long time, Ukrainian society needs to stay resilient, united about strategic goals, supportive of recovery, and actively engaged. This requires a shared vision of what good lo looks like. Uh, it requires bringing together resources, multiplying resources, looking for synergies, and targeting where they can make the most impact so how philanthropists can strengthen this all of course yeah, if, you can grants. Wrap, if you can please wrap up and then yeah, one minute then so yeah. there's a long list of what exactly can be done but uh one thing i just really want to mention and this is the uh agile recovery ecosystem which donors can produce which they can uh, help, help create and fund and this will uh, not be the contradiction of what the multi-stakeholder donor platform is doing or what the uh, Agency for Reconstruction and Recovery and Development of Ukraine is doing. This is a possibility to build a holistic approach between reconstruction reforms, European integration, and this is a space for designing and piloting and scaling up the working models, learning the lessons, taking uh, the stock of mistakes something which needs to be adjusted so this recovery ecosystem really needs to be working on synergies and the donors can be bringing in their own funding like the osf has created the ukraine development uh or the ukraine democracy fund uh last year it's been running for a year with the um funding of 25 million dollars and hopefully growing and it is uh looking into Ukraine's resilience and sustainable recovery as one of the strategic priorities. There are other donors who do their own funding and their own projects, investing in knowledge and expertise, in fostering independent media and communication, in creating and developing the dialogue platforms and this recovery ecosystem that I mentioned. So uh, in the run up for the London conference in June, we may think together and more on how this recovery ecosystem can be designed, how it can involve all uh, efforts and all actors who will be interested and willing to participate. We've got about a year to have this recovery ecosystem fully functional. And uh, why don't we start now? Happy to answer any questions and provide uh, other points. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ina. I'm sure people will come back to uh, for you to develop a bit more, but thanks for giving us this kind of macro overview about where civil society government stands. Uh, I can say from our own research, and it's based again on the survey of civil society organizations, Ukrainian civil society is seeking very constructive relations with both national and regional governments. Uh, when we asked organizations, how would you like to structure this cooperation? A lot of them said that they would like to be, for example, on the national level, part of the special advisory groups at line ministries, almost 80%. At the regional level, 97% said, if we want to be engaged in designing community recovery plans. We want to create civic oversight to monitor uh, actually reconstruction projects. And here I would like to bring in Olena because um, clearly one of the functions of independent civil society is this watchdog, is oversight, and it's actually responds to a lot of risks that Ukrainian uh, third sector sees around recovery. It's mainly embezzlement of funds, it's um, creation of new vested interests around funding flows. From your experience, and you know this kind of Ukraine struggle with corruption, um, like few people do, are you reassured that things are now being put in place to make sure recovery has trust, it has legitimacy? What gives you hope and perhaps what makes you worried? 
Elena, over to you. Thank you very much, Orisa. And thank you very much to Inna, because Inna made a very good big picture, and I will dive into more details uh, with regards to corruption as an anti-corruption activist. So if we, when we talk about reconstruction, I always speak about two levels and zero, um, zero corruption reconstruction on two levels. This is the macro level and the micro level. The macro level is about the general environment. It's about strong institutions. It's about changing the rules of the game according to which the um, public administration is operating in the country. Uh, and um, with regards to that, let's think, um, first of all, where the money for the reconstruction will be coming from. Uh, I hope that it will be coming from the confiscation of the Russian assets, because as those that are destroying Ukraine, Russia has to pay the biggest part of the bill, despite the fact that these things are stuck uh, on the legal uh, uh, disputes and debates. This is the thing which has to be moved and which has to be pushed forward. But also money will be coming from grants, hopefully in the, to the bigger extent from grants, to the lesser extent from loans, from the uh, foreign partners and private investments. Uh, what is instrumental for the private investments to come to Ukraine and what is key priority for all of the foreign donors? That's rule of law and effective systems of fighting against corruption. And here civil society has been playing incredibly important role since 2014, right now during the uh, full scale war and will obviously continue after the victory. Um, what we are doing, we are watchdogging, but not only watchdogging, the civil society has been a very active part of the, uh, those who are, um, thinking the architecture of those reforms, advocate for their uh, uh, adoption, and take an active part uh, of the implementation. And after that, monitor uh, how uh, these agencies are working, how the reform is implementing, and uh, push for more uh, legislative amendments if they are necessary. So that's basically the participation and each and every part of the reform cycle. This is not only about watchdogging in the traditional um, manner. It is about being uh, very actively engaged in that. Uh, what tools and instruments civil society have to continue to push for the reforms? This is obviously EU accession process. And I would say that this is a heavy artillery as the leverage for the advocacy of the reforms. Because if you take a look back uh, into what helped us to advocate for the establishment of NABU, SAPO, High Anti-Corruption Court. These were the linkages to visa liberalization uh, action plan with the European Union or IMF conditionalities. We will definitely continue having IMF programs, other financial programs that have um, conditionalities as clear reforms deliverables. What tasks, uh, outstanding tasks, do we have in this uh, macro level? Um, to continue uh, having anti-corruption infrastructure fully functional and independent, uh, to finalize the judicial reform. Right now we are having uh, the reform being done on the highest level from the cleansing of the judicial governance bodies, but they have to do their job with regards to cleansing of, of the court system. And time monopoly reform, which was unfortunately never properly addressed before, and this is the agency which has to oversee market relations and make sure that uh, new oligarchs are not appearing in the uh, area of reconstruction, which will obviously be a very uh, interesting part of the market. Media reform as a very important tool for the political uh, competition, tax and customs reform, and other reforms that are usually part of the EU accession process. If we speak about the micro level, uh, it is more about how to ensure that each and every cent of the uh, reconstruction funds uh, is used properly. And just last week, uh, together with colleagues, we were in DC meeting with the uh, uh, senators and congressmen, and one senator said us very clearly that uh, at the moment there is information about the embezzlement of one US dollar that would be an irreversible turn 
for the foreign assistance for Ukraine, be it military assistance, recovery assistance, whatever. And we understand and we consider um, this very serious. So it is incredibly important to put as much safeguards as possible to make sure that the process is brilliant and transparent from the very beginning. The stance of my organization is that post-victory recovery should be um, with a very active engagement with of foreign donors. We think that, uh, the, the, and that's the experience of our uh, previous monitoring, that the weakest point, the biggest vulnerability uh, of the reconstruction will be procurement processes. And we have to make sure that the safeguards for all of the procurement processes are there. So the, uh, the best safeguard from our perspective for post-victory recovery is to make sure that the procurements are being done uh, by, by the donors, by those who are uh, uh, bringing the funds. Um, we already see that the World Bank has established the, their trust fund, and it could be as, as one of the potential uh, platforms for that. However, the reality is that the reconstruction cannot wait until the victory, and the reconstruction is happening already now. Uh, where are we standing right now? The uh, government has established the Agency on the Recovery, which is headed by Mustafa Nayem, and it is under the uh, Vice Prime Minister Kubrakov. We are cautiously optimistic with regards to the work of this agency, because this is the team who proved to be able to deliver the results. And I want to praise um, uh, Vice Prime Minister personally, because he was engaged in the work of the Energy Task Force, who was seeking the necessary equipment, power transformers, necessary to keep our grid operational over the winter when Russia was doing Holodomor. And thanks to their efforts, uh, and thanks to the efforts, of course, of lots of other people, but uh, their contribution was huge as well, we managed to survive this winter without people freezing on the streets of our country. Uh, so um, how, how the process will look like. So the <laughs> cabinet of minister will work on the strategy of this immediate recovery. Ministry of Recovery will do prioritization of projects and the agency will do implementation. We do see the risks in this process, which are in the centralization of the process. As Inna very rightly mentioned, decentralization reform was one of the biggest country's achievements. It was also an anti-corruption tool. It has to be preserved and it has to be kept. So the first shortlist based on the uh, needs of the local administration's requests, which will be submitted to this agency, will be presented in the next few weeks. And this will be the real first test for the existing infrastructure and the system. What questions need to be answered? How to preserve decentralization? Uh, if in, in the existing scheme, the <coughs> submissions will be done by the local administrations and local administrations are representatives of, of the government. So we need to make sure that the voice of the local authorities and local self-governments is being presented and is not disregarded and that this regards all of the uh, mayors and not uh, those who have the favorable relationship with the uh, current authorities uh, with the with the central government uh, how can communities and people affect in the process of the priorities is a prior, I'm sorry, prioritization um, uh, of the projects and uh, making sure that they have the, the say uh, in, uh, in the reconstruction process. Uh, again, what will be the prioritization uh, on the governmental level and uh, how to make sure that those communities that are in real need get the first priorities? How to make sure that, uh, for example, what to do uh, if the uh, proposals will be of the higher quality from those regions who are of the lesser uh, damages and le therefore lesser prioritization. Uh, also, existing procedures do feel um, a lack of transparency for all of the decision-making processes, so how these decisions will be made. Um, these are the things which we have to keep a very close eye on to make sure that if we are seeing any um, vulnerabilities, they have to be properly addressed and fixed. 
um, the agency, as I've already told this agency for the reconstruction, and that's my last point, um, is very open for engagement of the civil society. Uh, they uh, have already conveyed a number of obsessions mm -hmm. and seem to be open for the consultations and the proposals of the civil society. Moreover, uh, in uh, January and February, there was the set the rounds of improvement of the legislation on public procurement. And uh, we have also submitted our amendments to that uh, and are more or less happy with the results. But this is absolutely an ongoing process as well. And if new uh, flows or weaknesses appear, they have to be fixed as well. Uh, as Inna said, uh, colleagues from the Rice Ukraine coalition are doing great job in terms of um, pushing for the electronic system for the recovery and reconstruction management. This will be the platform for the coordination of donors, investors, government, local authorities, uh, contractors and society and civil society and investigative uh, journalists to make sure that everybody has the understanding about how the projects are being uh, implemented. Um, they are um, taking into account our experience with the open data, digital tools, Prozoro, and all those things. And uh, I, I also want to praise their work on that. But it's also very important to keep investing in the local civil society and investigative journalists. So basically those who are in place, who have the biggest vested interest in the positive sense to have proper schools, proper hospitals, proper roads and those who can physically come, uh, touch uh, and uh, uh, monitor and watchdog the implementation of those contracts on the uh, local level. Uh, having all those uh, things and uh, elements in place, civil society uh, on the level of the uh, crafting, advocating, implementation, and watchdogging, both on the national and uh, local levels, I'm sure will help to close down a number of vulnerabilities and loopholes and make sure that we do have trust both from the society and international community towards our reconstruction. Well, when, when you listen to Olena, you clearly have a feeling that this could be a springboard for Ukraine. I mean, there's, I, I always am personally energized and fascinated by the level of ambition in Ukraine, right? I mean, the, the Ukrainian people are not somebody who will settle somewhere in the middle way. Uh, of course, I mean, like in any society, there are those who are more active and those who, you know, are, are more of a consumers of all of this. But what is quite striking to me and, and actually good news about how Ukrainian recovery uh, uh, will go forward is the quite strong modernization agenda of civil society itself. And again, I'm referring to the civil society survey we've done. Actually, I'd like to thank our partners, the International Relations Foundation, the Oh, somebody is on Inter the, the partners that helped us actually to gather these opinions, the USAID Civil Society Assistance Program, where basically 85% of national uh, groups say uh, the main reconstruction priority is modernization of state institutions. And here, interestingly, we can come back to that in discussion, your comment, Olena, about um, the outsourcing of procurement to donors. I'd actually be you know, careful about it. Because if we want to modernize these institutions, we want to make sure that Ukrainians can do this procurement um, you know, as effectively and corrupt-free as possible. Uh, but that, you know, that is something to discuss exactly what you meant by it. And I would like to now turn to Irina, because we are now bringing it down to uh, the city level, to it being the city that suffered enormously. I mean, it had almost 70% of its um, public infrastructure and housing damaged. I, I was in European in September, and it's quite a it's quite a dystopian picture today because on one hand you see life goes on, kids play football, markets being open, but then you see these black holes, these black holes in people's lives that Russian aggression have created. 
um, and, and, and I think that it's quite um, uh, inspiring also what we will hear from Irina, how they are going about overcoming this trauma. And an interesting fact actually from research in psychology where if people feel ownership of anything that they contribute, they actually value it much higher. Be it a little origami that you build yourself, you're always willing to pay a higher value it as a higher price than if somebody gave it to you. And I think this is one of the principles where uh, if people are now part of creators of their city, they would love their city more, they would value their city more. But Irina will tell us how they go about it. I, I'm looking forward to hear from you. Thank you, Aurasia. Yesterday it was uh, said that you please put up the presentation. Yeah, we can stand from the video uh, yeah. from destruction. Uh, if it's possible, I sent yesterday link. It's a uh, presentation, but if it's possible, uh, <laughs> link about destructions and just a little bit remind. If no, Orisa, you describe very exactly what's going on uh, on the ground. And yesterday it was said the anniversary when the enemy was gone and when the city was deoccupied. Mm -hmm. And the mayor of Irpin, Alexander Markushin, and uh, we as a volunteers and advisors to the mayor, we openly announced that we need uh, support for reconstruction and cleaning our city. And it's incredible. Citizens, volunteers, NGOs, representatives, more than 200 specialists joined to online session not just from Ukraine, but also from different countries all over the world. In a few days after, uh, more than 100 architects were coming to Irpin to see what's going on. And um, then we understand that we have this huge emotions and huge opportunities to involve citizens, NGO and experts to help for Irpin, because we used to be one of the rich city, small cities in Ukraine. And as you can imagine, at that moment, uh, we lose our budget, we lose our opportunities and etc. So it was question how we can unite these uh, amazing people. And we united them to the project of reconstruction, Irpin Reconstruction Summit. We organize it regularly one month, uh, during one month. Mm -hmm. We can move next page. Next. Who were these people? Architects, urbanists, project managers, fundraiser, lawyers, etc. We invited all who can support us. Next. At the beginning, we divided, uh, we suggested we uh, need to have all list of our needs and destroyed infrastructure and divide people to the specific group. At that moment, it was exactly about uh, rebuilding of concrete and specific uh, school, stadium, uh, hospital, etc. And recently, we create new groups because we invited all citizens, uh, we invited all citizens, but registered were 100 city Irpin people, and we divided them to different group like urban planning group, like uh, economically fundraising group, like uh, social group, like infrastructure group. It's, uh, we can move for next. And uh, as a result, uh, we uh, receive uh, di different proposal. For example, uh, 20 social facilities uh, budget projects, 22 uh, visual rendering projects. Uh, now we are receiving a suggestion to new strategy of the occupied airplane, and we are working on that. But it is also a challenge for us because we, uh, we never had such kind of experience to rebuild the city during the war and to rebuild the city after war and be in the city uh, we are damaged, most damaged city in the Kyiv region, and we were like first the occupied city. So it looks like we were uh, we were first on this, and we decided uh, not give up because our soldiers they don't have their weekends. They they protect our borders every day, and if uh, some uh, our citizens can judge us because sometimes they uh, very often they don't have electricity, they don't have their basic needs. And we try to answer easily. And I try to personally answer easily. Each of us in our personal uh, battlefield. 
if you feel that you need to fight for your basic needs, please continue to do. But if I am as a project manager feel that I want to fight for my city, I need to do it right now and not lose this moment. Next. So you can see this imagine project. It was done by hearts, by volunteers, by architect and project managers, which we mentioned. Next. And it uh, so one of the challenges it was the project management and the knowledge about this. And uh, we kindly invite all of you uh, support us with this because we move as far as we can. And you already we uh, on progress of establishing uh, the project uh, um, United. Nation task force for a pin uh, with UN agency UNESCO. We also expect expect some support from uh, other different foundation, and uh, it it will give and provide us with technical assistance, with funding and knowledge exchange opportunities. So it's really important for us. So you can see on the board, it can be like a model for other reconstruction because it's very important to talk about about Lugano principles, but we need to know how to work with the people on the ground and how we need to manage the process of reconstruction. We have um, decision makers. We have uh, uh, me and, my, and our team about project management office uh, who is uh, uh, making the process uh, run. And we found ourselves as a, how to say, capital of reconstruction of Ukraine. Why? Because even Linda Kinsler from New York Times, she wrote that Irpin is a real laboratory for reconstruction. And we united, uh, we united more than 50 organizations from France, from United States biggest architect company, Gensler, uh, which see Irpin as a, a green garden with a smart heart. And we discuss this model with our citizens right now, uh, this vision, I'm sorry. And uh, we have experts from Chile. We have experts from Netherlands, from Italy, big cluster of who helps us, Stefano Boeri with his famous vertical garden, Green Building Council uh, helps us with lead protocols because, because we need to follow agenda of uh, joining to European Union. And as I mentioned, Lugano principles and Ukrainian national plan. Next, next, next. Please. It's uh, so you can see that we invited uh, our um, citizens uh, to different round tables, to different working groups. We organized committee session as well. Also, we uh, uh, organized already more than 20 uh, local online chat. And uh, also we involve citizens via a questionnaire. And uh, it gives us also a hope because uh, it was amazing that 85% of respondents for this questionnaire, which we prepare with Sotis and uh, Gensler, uh, to show that uh, people felt at home in their own neighborhoods, 85%, next please. 59% reported satisfaction with the quality of, light, of life uh, that existed in Irpin before the invasion. So we exactly know that our uh, European people, they want to live at home, they want to back home, already received 85% of uh, residents because it's what their bills shows us that. So, and our citizens want to be involved in these processes. But it's very important also to, to focus on restarting the economy because we don't need just infrastructure. This infrastructure needs to be used by our people and our people need to be happy, they need to work and they need to come back. So, um, the recent survey showed us also that unemployment increased by 10% after the invasion. 56% uh, of respondents said that their jobs could cover all living expense after the invasion, compared to 81% uh, before. Next. So it's exactly sociology. We have a, big, a huge sociology uh, questions, around 60 questions, uh, and all of these questions recorded, uh, so it uh, can be easily uh, checked for such kind of institution like who anti-corruption or different uh, watchdogs, etc. We, we try to involve our citizens, and we also try to invite you to help us doing this as much as possible because we never had this experience. Next. Uh, here I mention about uh, the existing of national recovery 
recovery plan and probably you have seen that it was calculated that uh, reconstruction will be cost around 750 billions of uh, billions dollars so it's mean a lot of works but i found each of the city like a, a brick for a, a brick and the ukraine is a huge wall so the quality of this uh, huge reconstructed war it's uh, each of the brick each city which needed uh, to be reconstructed the quality of brick is need to be uh, is need to be very well organized and it, it need to be uh, with all these principles which i mentioned before next so as i said we are really uh, decided not to wait what national plan of recovery gonna say since uh, already we uh, have been visiting more than hundreds of institutions, it is uh, also institute European uh, Committee of the Regions, uh, it is European Parliament members, uh, we were going to United States, we work in workshop with the Gensler, now we're preparing for meeting with American mayors, we signed winning with the Kashkaiš, who helps us with 500,000 for reconstruction, the kindergarten, we signed even uh, three sister cities with the Miami, and we're proud of them because they're being, it's far away from the like similarity of Miami, but anyway, uh, next. And uh, we understand that we are quite famous, sadly famous all over the world. And we understand that we are face of reconstruction of Ukraine. So one more time, we kindly, invest, uh, kindly invited you to give us a chance, being really nice example, example for reconstruction to build back better with the old principles of Logano conference and with the real involvement of our citizens because it looks like we are closest to our um, people and we, it looks like we already start this journey this long journey next in it just i will finish with this example so this building uh, damaged more than 40 percent first pictures it's the pictures how we can easily reconstruct making coating and making uh, maybe if it's gonna possible two extra floors for homeless people because in the been 15,000 homeless people. And it and it costs, it will be cost around $400,000. Uh, and third picture, it is uh, the same building, but how it could, could look like if designers and architects gonna make it uh, beautiful. But the question is money because it's this second picture we cost $1 million. Uh, dollars. Yeah, so we can rebuild two like kind of for the, like the price like of this one so the question will be also like financial and uh, uh, we as a being understand that that we need to plan strategy not just uh, for rebuilding but we need to see our vision of future of the city we need to plan our uh, investment potential we understand that we have kind of very interesting location is seven kilometers from Kiev. we have three highways and we have railways uh, so we think all cities should to think about their vision and strategy of the city as well, not just about reconstruction, but also about their future and what their people's waiting and not postpone our current life. Well, thank you very much. You know, it's, it's fascinating. I think it also shows you how when Ukrainians see the problem, they try to seek solution uh, almost despite all the big forces that are you know the war still rages on right let's let's keep just keep keeping this in perspective that you know russia still uh, continues a full scale bombardment across all across ukraine but this um uh, hope through the uh, you know the rubble uh, springs very strongly and and i think it's fascinating that you mentioned the restarting of economy and the public opinion of citizens across ukraine what people want is jobs they want jobs the third of ukrainian economy tank there's unemployment, their life has been turned upside down. So I think it's so important that we may come back to that in Q&A. But I have a lot of questions coming in uh, in the online chat, but I would like to first ask you also in the audience here, if you raise your hand, please ask brief questions, introduce yourself, say where you are from. I will be reading questions uh, from Zoom. Um, I will not be unmuting people for the sake of speed. Um, and let's get the conversation going, please. Oh, yes, well, thank you very much. This was a fascinating round of presentations. 
My question is... Uh, please introduce yes, yourself. Yes, I'm Maria Golubova from uh, the Bosch Academy in Berlin. I'm at the moment studying what could be improved in the way the EU supports Ukraine and Moldova in the succession process. Um, my question is about the particular ways in which civil society could be more um, sort of, well, integrally engaged in, um, in the way uh, central and regional governments are planning reconstruction. I mean, for example, would it make sense to have uh, framework contracts for think tanks and other CSOs which have expertise to come to the aid of local authorities to write their reconstruction strategies? Because I heard from Mustafa Nayyam that uh, the issue of capacity to write regional and local strategies is something that is uh, that is actually uh, not always uh, always provided. That's a very inter interesting question. I think it also probably connects to something about the agile recovery ecosystem that Ina was talking about. How do you connect the dots? And maybe because I know that uh, International Relations Foundation was supporting think tanks for a while, uh, even before this invasion. So maybe we'll start with Ina and then bring it back to Irina whether you need such assistance and, and, and uh, how could that be useful. So, Ina, over to yeah. you. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks, Maria. This is a great question about framework contracts and the think tanks. We would love to have more think tanks participating. Uh, we would also love to have uh, the uh, Ukrainian entities, local authorities, municipalities, seeing the need, but also having the resources to contract some such services and see how those can uh, be integrated into their recovery planning and implementation and monitoring in a sense of testing whether the things are developing in the right way. So uh, that, that's, that's uh, one of the possibilities. There are many other tools that may be employed, but the bottom line here would be, I think it is uh, also useful for international partners and the Ukrainian government and Ukrainian municipalities think of Ukrainian actors as potential co-implementers, providers of knowledge, providers of uh, services, uh, which can design and test and pilot and then scale up uh, these specific interventions. Irina, from this point. Well, what's your take? It's an amazing uh, question and a big uh, headache for us as a, and for me as a project manager of uh, the um, reconstruction of Irpin because, uh, as I said, we involve uh, more than 200 speci uh, specialists and volunteers. And uh, we, as a project, we haven't been financed by city council or by uh, national government. Uh, at the beginning, it was... Um, just our volunteer and doing by heart. And uh, we really uh, believe that uh, very soon, uh, such kind of organization like International uh, Renaissance, Renaissance Foundation or et cetera, they will announce uh, grants and opportunities for such kind of teams who want to rebuild their cities. Also, we were, we are waiting for European Commission uh, grants uh, and uh, United Nations, because it's crucial if we want to involve and engage specialists, they need to cover their bills they can't uh, 100 uh, time of their work spent with it but rebuilding the city it's not just volunteering for one two hours as the, like like uh, green uh, greening or etc it's kind of a whole time even more than the whole time job yeah. thank you very much uh, i'd like to take uh, a question from here from zoom from irina melnikovska she was our fellow here now she's based in germany She's asking, apart from the state, private business, both international domestic, will be a critical actor in Ukraine's reconstruction. And we do know that the upcoming Ukraine Recovery Conference in London in June will be focused a lot on bringing in investors and, and private sector front and central to Ukraine's recovery. Is private business, she's asking, a foe or a friend of Ukrainian civil society? In which area would be a coalition between business actors and civil society possible and mutually beneficial? Maybe uh, we'll go to you, Olena, and then yes, of course. ask others. Well, uh, it's of, course, of course, it is a friend because, uh, I mean, if you take a look at the um, what were the requests of uh, businesses, but not only for in Ukrainian businesses as well, for years, they were naming the reforms of the judiciary and uh, fighting against corruption. 
and they were pushing that. And I, I absolutely know that this was uh, among the priorities also of the IMF and World Bank, particularly because it directly relates to the business uh, climate. So I think that we are absolutely on the same page with the businesses and their demand for the real uh, reforms will also be the leverage for us to push these reforms forward. Would you like to add something? I would yeah. like to add that we need to not forget that uh, very often activism and business sometimes in confrontation, but at the same time, exactly business, they give this uh, employment and uh, give opportunities uh, and to city to restart the economy. So it's very important to also to meet with uh, uh, businessmen be with entrepreneurs and uh, talk with them and uh, take into uh, account their uh, their voice. Um, I also would like just to bring in an example from businesses, like in global companies, for example, I mean, the question is what can be done now as the war rages on and one of the companies, FMC, which is a big agricultural company, this year is donating 3% of its profits to demine Ukraine, for example. So there are, uh, in addition to just, you know, investing and, and being present or maintaining or developing is, is specific funding streams that could, uh, you know, in, in a way free up Ukrainian agricultural land. And, and uh, I'm sure there are other examples I don't know, but it would be interesting to bring them in uh, into a conversation. Uh, I'd like to go in there. Yes. Hi, Joshua Bowersold. Um, we've created a coalition called Ukraine Tomorrow, which is bringing together tech innovators from all over. In fact, the reason I'm late is I was just coming back from MIT Media Lab and mm -hmm. had a bit of a problem getting into London from the airport. But um, what, what we're trying to do is bring all of the benefits of fintech and innovative use of uh, new technologies, including AI, to the reconstruction. The goal uh, underlying the group is the fastest and most digital reconstruction in the history of uh, catastrophe, let's call it a war. Mm -hmm. And I didn't hear the word innovation and uh, SMEs in, in what we heard today so far, although I missed part of it, of course. So I want to know how you see that working, because I think agencies have a ten tendency to centralize decision making in a way that could slow down the process, whereas the innovation that we have in our hands today uh, could make this a very interesting and speedy accelerated uh, reconstruction. Yeah, fascinating. I'd like to stay a little bit on this question of innovation, because also in, in our survey, when we asked what is the added value of civil society and recovery, number three was actually innovative solutions. Can so, I give two yeah, examples? Yeah, mind. go ahead. Um, so one of our projects is already launched. We're going to 3D print a school in Lviv. So mm -hmm. that's already launched and financed by, by many of these people, are Ukrainian uh, exited entrepreneurs in the US and here in Europe. Uh, second project uh, is a, a project to use drones to map and demine. So we figured out a way to detect drones from the air, or detect mines from the air, and automatically set up a, a process for the removal. And, and one of the goals of this group, um, most of it entrepreneurs in tech uh, and people from civil society, is to make that cost that we all know is going to be massive. Right. Uh, we want to cut that cost and achieve much better results. Because uh, our conviction is that 750 billion or a trillion is the let's say the estimate done in the old way by the by the uh, IFOs. And we think we can bring that cost down and achieve better results yeah. with innovation. Fantastic. I think that is a good news to bring the cost down. Yeah, I'll see Ina raising hand. Maybe we'll go first to Irina and then to Ina on, are there any specific examples or how you think this could be connected to the groups on the ground? Irina and then Ina. I would like to say that uh, we as a city council also uh, stand in for innovation solutions and uh, we uh, also invited citizens uh, to provide different ideas and uh, we will be happy to welcome you in Irpin with your ideas but and also very often we would uh, like to say of course we will happy with your investment and etc. Uh, but very often we receive like suggestion of services, you know, and city very often not ready to pay for uh, like uh, new services or products, which uh, very often it's uh, uh, like uh, companies try to sell. We really looking for innovation solution, like for smart cities, for accounting. Like right now we are working with Tison. Uh, this is a transport uh, logistic co company uh, for organizing uh, correct uh, public transport log logistic that our uh, passengers uh, and citizens will, will be satisfied with uh, 
logistic uh, public transport. And it is in each area important to have such kind of innovative solution and smart decisions. So uh, it's really interesting and needed process and we appreciate it, we would we appreciate it. Thank you, Ina. Uh, thank you. I was very glad to hear uh, the words of uh, innovation, but also small and medium enterprises. And indeed, this is uh, uh, something we haven't discussed a lot. Uh, I wanted to uh, add a couple of points here. So one is uh, about uh, the possibility for small and medium enterprises. Specifically, I am, of course, uh, interested in those who are working in Ukraine to have access to funding, access to contracts, to prepare themselves already knowing how the system will be working, what the requirements are. So this kind of information about all potential contracts and the projects which will be available and to which uh, uh, small and medium enterprises also can contribute their innovative solutions and uh, participate and earn from them as well uh these these are kind this is kind of information which we expect to be available also through this digital reconstruction management system and uh, that's part of what we want as kind of transparency so that uh the private sector could also participate uh and have access to funding as well uh, uh well that's probably a bigger and different conversation and i hope there will be a lot of specific models discussed uh and showcased already in london this summer uh but before that businesses are preparing and that's great for us uh, social uh, small and medium enterprises and i almost made a slip of tongue saying social enterprises because that's where a lot of linkages between civil society communities and small and medium businesses already occur providing social services, providing jobs, providing incentives and opportunities for internally displaced people that are also internally displaced businesses, as you know, and there is the whole program in Ukraine on how to help businesses relocate and uh, also how to help them adjust. And I do hope there will be space for them to participate in recovery and there will be instruments for that. There's another word, uh, actually two words, and, I, uh, and I'll stop here. It's impact investment. This is something we are specifically interested to explore further. And there are many avenues for uh, collaborations between civil society and the private sector in the impact investment tracks. Uh, happy to discuss further. <laughs> Great. I'm happy we are moving beyond grants, loans, and uh, just, uh, you know, foundation donations, because the, exactly with the scale we are talking about, we need to think innovatively. And there are there are tools. Uh, I hope they can be applied to Ukraine's case as well. You wanted to... Uh, uh, yes, uh, probably I would like to um, answer your question a little bit beyond of tech innovations, because I'm not a, a tech person. Uh, but we in Ukraine has been um, very open to any innovations since 2014. And we have been very actively using that for fighting against corruption because having extraordinary problems, you need to seek for extraordinary solutions. And those things like Prozoro electronic declaration system, or for example, my organization launched the database of politically exposed person well beyond, uh, you know, it was um, um, uh, officially adopted on the state level. So we, we were first who started to use um, uh, electronic tools to monitor the lifestyles of um, the most um, uh, politically important people uh, in our society. Uh, as I've said, I don't know, uh, you might have missed that, but colleagues from the RISE coalition, they are working on the digital solutions for the management of the recovery process. And they are, I'm sure, are very open to uh, any of those ideas. And our innovations basically go well beyond this uh, electronic tools. We are even innovating the standards of the Council of Europe, for example, on the judicial independence when we started reforming our judicial governance bodies with the participation of external experts. So we as Ukraine are very open to um, uh, seeking for the solutions that are beyond the uh, established um, you know, uh, ways and approaches. And we are very open to anything like that. And I'm sure that we are a testing ground and we will be able to spread these innovations 
and to share our experience, to share our practices to other countries. Hopefully, which won't be seeing the same problems as we are, but uh, smaller problems and uh, ready solutions. Fantastic. And here I'd like to uh, take Nicolas Bonvoison question to Irina directly. And he is asking, is there a legal obligation in Ukraine for pro providing public participation in planning and pro programming? And are you making this happen in practice? Is in a way, is it requirement that you do this or it's your own initiative? Actually, we began to do that just because of by our heart. Uh, we openly invited uh, people and we become uh, published that uh, in our uh, website uh, official website and uh, then uh, when uh, we become to receive different uh, journalist uh, questions uh, inter uh, uh, interview or also uh, commentaries from uh, uh, social uh, media we understand that uh, oh come back we are under the war process but anyway nothing changed for you uh, for ukraine uh, everything should be according to ukrainian law and according to ukrainian law uh, we need to have this uh, public consultation public, public hearings public hearings uh, if it's uh, uh, affects some big spheres etc and also some decision like strat uh, rewriting of the strategy of the city it's kind of a big deal and which uh, need to be in the citizen need to be involved so yes there were under the programs uh, pro progress and sadly uh, citizens criticize that uh, you are doing some uh, paperwork and i don't have i don't have my window i don't have my roof but we understand anyway it's kind of plus and minuses for mayor for his um, uh, reputation because uh, everyone is who needs a bay, uh, their roofs and uh, windows they expected from him roofs mm -hmm. and other activities they expected public public uh, publications in uh, website yeah i think it's a very precarious line to walk between you know immediate needs of people and long term thinking uh it's it's uh, very very difficult to find the golden balance between that and I guess it also comes back to uh, with this rapid recovery fund uh, that you should have a basic level and people should see that this help is coming. Then they can focus a little bit more on the midterm and long term. But here, just to connect to what you said from the Zoom uh, chat again, Cornelia Perl says that she is from the uh, she's a senior project advisor from the Council of Europe, and she said we work since 2018 in Ukraine on engaging citizens in decision making. She's happy to share uh, any materials that would help consultation methodologies, deliberation models. I'm happy to connect and share, you know, uh, whatever Council of Europe practice has. Um, so this is just to park that this is there's an offer Amazing. of um, uh, of, um, uh, of this resource. Uh, anybody else in the room? I don't want to just be yes, Vlad and then Marina. Yes. Um, I'll take two questions. Two quick questions, uh, Vlagalushka OSF. Uh, one is for Irina. I mean, you're learning a lot of lessons, and I'm sure people in other cities that were devastated are learning them too. What sort of lessons are you taking when you share them with colleagues who are in a similar position, you know, mayor of like small and mid sized cities as they're recovering them? Because um, it would be, I think, really interesting for people to hear these comparative notes as they come out. And my second question, since we're in London, you know, there is going to be the London Reconstruction Conference. Um, and it's probably for Olena and Ina as well. What sort of expectations do you have now after Lugano, after Berlin, to make sure that we sort of move beyond broad point discussions? Um, there are now concerns that, you know, that the UK government is rightly determined to make it about private uh, partnerships. Um, how sort of civil society can fit into this without being like a third wheel on a date, right? So how how to make this an organic uh, combination? Thanks. Excellent. Yes, hello. Uh, I'm actually, uh, yes, I'm a Ukrainian living in London. I'm actually originally from Irpin, and I joined the um, online session uh, on Ukraine, on Irpin's reconstruction. It's a global society, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. 
And I was amazed to see, as Irina said, so many citizens of the European Union actually deliberating and uh, devising the strategy and so on. Um, my question is, uh, the development across Ukraine and the recovery efforts are very uneven. Mm -hmm. And not every community is as active as European. And you don't have, uh, you know, like engaged civil society or very motivated authorities on the ground, not in every community, unfortunately. So my question is to, uh, for example, to uh, the donor community, uh, how can you kind of stimulate uh, those communities in Ukraine which are not stepping forward, either they're civil societies or sometimes they could be very weak civil society on the ground, uh, or local authorities to uh, kind of to come up with ideas and can you actually do anything? Because in principle, according to decentralization reform, they are not obliged to do that. So somehow you have to give them a push. Is could will there be something that could be done? And what is the role that the donors could play? Is this connected to this, or you can wait? Oh, it is partly. So yes, okay. I mean, I, I'll maybe chip in here. Um, the uh, the wonderful thing about Ukrainian civil society is that you can find lots of expertise for virtually every issue. And uh, in terms of engaging local society, Hramada, the, the local community, in planning, uh, say, city recovery or regional recovery, there are so many good experts. I mean, there is a think tank, think tank called CEDES, which has uh, been doing this work for a very long time. I remember myself going to do participatory action research sessions in ivano Frankivsk and uh, Odessa with them. They are really, I mean, they are one depository of, of expertise and knowledge, and there are many others. So I think it's very important to, you know, to keep those people in the loop and uh, for the government and for the EU and other donors to actually find money to keep them in the loop, because it's, it's true what Irina said, you need grants, you need uh, some kind of funds. I mean, whether it's a contract like a tender for consultancy, whether it's a grant, but you need a lot of that to be able to, to engage all those wonderful local experts. Okay. So I'll now bring back to the panel, but lessons, expectations from Ukraine Recovery Conference, and maybe you can also say something about donors, how can they help? We have our paper like with our mistakes and with our successful points as we do in this for one year. And it's really important to notice these things. We have, as I said, like some positive things, but also we made mistakes. And it's important to uh, make this model uh, and uh, to meet with other cities to create kind of forums to invite uh, city councillors to invite mayors and, volunte and volunteers and activists to, to such kind of events and promote like uh, nice real examples and to highlight that be careful with this yeah. with this with this also uh, we will be happy uh, like as a city council with our model of reconstruction to share our experience in this kind of international events in London uh, and, if, and the same in London but uh, not for not yet we haven't received uh, like any invitation for this but nobody we, did nobody. Nobody. <laughs> <laughs> so we believe uh, our experience will be needed in such kind of conference so as well also about um, Keeping, it's important to keep in touch with a Lviv expert because they have nice experience with writing strategy and they come up to us, they writing that we see what you do, we want to some like, uh, somehow to help you. It's important to have this facilitator who has their experience and to important to keep in touch with them. It's, it's a bit like you need this recovery movement in Ukraine. It's, it's a network of people across different sectors that contribute variety of things. I think it has more of a spirit of a movement rather than some kind of a rigid structure and then something to think about. I uh, would like to bring in Ina on uh, specifically expectations from the conference and also as a funder, something that um, Maria, Marina was saying about resources, how do we stimulate, uh, and Maria bringing it back, you, you need resources to do this. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Uh, uh, thank, thanks for this uh, uh, question on London. So I think uh, it will be uh, good if we see the specific mechanisms of how recovery ideas and recovery plans can be implemented on a micro level, on very specific uh, municipality-based, uh, industry-based, sector-based, so on and so forth level. And uh, it's really um, an, an opportunity to see how uh, the cases which will be presented can be cascaded, multiplied, 
used, adapted, so on and so forth, so looked from the perspective of what it took to have them implemented, so on and so forth. There is another thing is uh, it will be an opportunity to look for win-wins between the sectors, uh, between the pr private sector, the public sector, the communities, the civil society, citizens, consumers, and uh, the international community as well. It will be important to look into uh, independent accountability mechanisms which need to be put in place and i'm sure the private sector is very conscious of the importance to be account of being accountable to the society to the country where uh, they they will be working it's not just the anti-corruption uh, or efficiency and all these kinds of measure measurements. It's uh, really the independent accountability mechanisms which will show the society that the uh, inputs have their interests at the heart. They are sustainable. They look into the new technologies, uh, innovation, and they benefit uh, the people. And also, uh, it would be great to discuss the opportunities for wider stakeholder engagement and for the access to opportunities that the um, recovery will bring to different sectors. A quick on uh, the how to stimulate less active communities. This is what's happening all the time. Uh, this is uh, uh, what civil society is doing with a lot of help from the donors. And it was mentioned here. The civil society is quite diverse. It will not be present in a specific village or less present in a specific town, but there are wide networks and a lot of collaborations. Donors can bring in fast, agile, responsive, easy to get, relatively easy to, to get grants, and also create these platforms at which the learning and exchange and collaborations uh, are organized, building local schools, uh, local courses, hubs, capacity development uh, uh, events, idea marketplaces, creative participation infrastructure this is how we call that uh, donor funding is available for that information about that is available for that uh, and uh, there is a lot of uh, collaborations between the communities and uh, uh, the civil society organizations in place so those which have less in their own communities can easily connect with a lot of uh, other peers and take it forward so there's nothing preventing communities and people from being more engaged now. Yes. Hi, uh, Laura Svenke from the FCDO uh, Ukraine Recovery Conference team. Um, first of all, just to say it's a recovery conference, not reconstruction. Um, and I just have a question, if I may, um, to our speakers um, about decentralization and community engagement, because we are hearing the message that civil society want accountability and they want transparency, but they also want to say in, in what recovery looks like. Mm -hmm. So the question I have is what are the current barriers and, and how can things improve um, with regards to decentralization? Yeah, very. Maybe we'll we'll direct this question to Irina, and then we'll come back to Lena. Yes, yeah, specifically, Irina, what stands on the way now, in, in, with the exception of obvious things, war and martial law, but specifically, uh, how do you facilitate, or what's what's the obstacle to decentralization? We uh, see that uh, like the main uh, task for Ukraine is uh, protect their border and uh, a lot of finance and etc. and uh, need to be controlled under, under military because uh, we need to protect our border and our regions. And uh, we like kindly understand that uh, it's main priority. But and sometimes uh, some decisions, uh, like for example, for city council, maybe it's not like what we expected for me. Maybe we expected as a city who, which become a hero city, which lost seventy six percent, need to be somehow prioritized how it's need to be rebuilt it, and uh, in how much money should be sent, and uh, how influence like political trends. Uh, influence that because we we have like uh, presidential uh, uh, 
mayors, I mean, from his political party and from others, whether it's important or it's not important, it's like also a question, like, uh, like transparency process of that. Also uh, about, like uh, barriers which uh, which we can uh, we can have uh, we uh, we know that uh, a lot of uh, funds they are ex directly uh, comes to ministry of hamadas or regional development etc and they uh, announce this uh, like kind of grant opportunity for in different hamadas and different communities and it's also the question how these hamadas taking part of this announce uh, of this applying to these grants uh, also so it's a number of other decentralization questions, but be, be honest, I am mostly involved to reconstruction process and I'm uh, sadly I'm not contact very much with different ministries, it's mostly a uh, work of city council and uh, public servants, I'm not. So I will be happy, Olena, say more yeah, about it. Uh, well, basically, I tried to touch this a little bit uh, in my presentation that uh, the current model uh, of the recovery and reconstruction, it does uh, ha it has some potential loopholes. Uh, I hope that they won't uh, be misused, uh, and it's very early to say uh, how the things will look like. But the fact that the final decision is being uh, on the priorities uh, and uh, on the proposals which will be supported uh, is to be made by Kamin. Uh, obviously leaves some, um, uh, uh, how do you say it, um, um, freedom in their hands, you know, to hand pick this project. So it's important to make sure that when this first announcement uh, of the portfolio of projects, which will be supported to make the analysis and to make sure that uh, all of the communities, um, uh, those uh, very much in need, that their uh, decisions, uh, that, that their proposals are being uh, taken into account. And here I mean Makolaev community, Chernihiv community, and uh, so, some others which also uh, suffered a lot and continue to be suffered because they are right now, well, Chernihiv not, but Makolaev is still a front line. Is, is this just to ask, is there any role for funders in the governance of the agency? Is there any way that they could shape up the procedures, the, the, the way the rules for distributing this funds will be? Well, uh, uh, right to? now, yeah. this is in, at the discretion of the cabinet of ministers okay. to decide. Uh, again, at the moment, uh, we see that uh, it is that mechanism is being misused. I assume that we definitely, as the civil society, would be pushing. Uh, but what we are right now pushing is more transparency of all of the uh, stages. Yes, and uh, not, not even transactions, the transparency of decision making okay. to understand what proposals were submitted, why the proposals were turned down, were they really of the bad quality or they were turned down because of some political reasons? What are the priorities, you know, which will be supported in the end, uh, comparing to those uh, which were not supported. So th there are people, particularly uh, colleagues from the Rice Coalition, who are following this process very closely. Uh, but, but it's very important that uh, Romada's voice is not lost uh, in this process, because it is also, you know, a kind of a balance to keep, because in case of centralization, obviously the decisions might be done faster, which is a priority for the country uh, in war. But we want the, to keep the centralization because that was very important, which obviously might require more time, but in the long run, that would bring much more benefits for the sustainability of the operation of our state, because that's you know the goal towards which we are moving. So you have to keep all those things in balance and make sure that everything is being taken into account. If I may very briefly add on the um, civil society. And um, uh, well, it's an absolutely natural process that you have to invest in the capacities of the civil society. And if there is no 
civil society yet, it doesn't mean that you cannot help uh, it to appear there. Yes, and not only civil society, investigative journalists. We have a, an amazing um, uh, example of how Nashi Groshi, uh, there was investigative media located in Kyiv, uh, helped to bring up uh, investigative journalists in regions. Mm -hmm. They were not cooperating with them on a, a random, uh, you know, once per uh, a while uh, a basis approach. No, they hired basically local representatives in Zaporizhia, Lviv, few more cities who were working on the ground, but as their representative, and they invested plenty of time in their capacities, you know, starting from, I don't know, rewriting their investigations, helping them to make this investigation, saying that, hey, you are not doing this properly, let's do it but jointly. It's quality, yeah. Yes, it's about capacities. And in the end, you know, they were working, they had this project like for a year or something, in the end, they had a, a ready, trained, well-trained and well-experienced investigative journalists on the spots. So if we have this systemic capacity building project, that would be easier to um, invest. It's it, in a way with this war, Ukraine wants more democracy, not less democracy. I think this conversation is about that. It's about, you know, the, again, this opinion poll that Ina referred to, 98% of Ukrainians across all regions want to have functional democracy. And what we are discussing today are the elements of that functional democracy. I'd like to bring in two more questions from the audience. Apologies uh, in advance, all those questions I could not take on Zoom, but we will take note of them for our future conversation. <coughs> we'll take here and here. Yeah. Uh, hello, uh, so Stan Trabano from the Department for Business and Trade. Very uh, two quick questions. Are there specific sectors of reform at the national government level where the civil society is not being led in? Where, um, for whatever reason, and again, I'm not talking about military strategy or whatever, but reform and corruption governance. And secondly, what has been the impact of a diminished uh, workforce in civil society since the war? Mm. Um, thank you. I wanted to pick up on that. Introduce yourself. I'm Jessica Fallon from the ICRC, um, the International Committee of the Red Cross. Um, I just wanted to pick up on, on um, a point uh, made earlier between the tension at, um, between meeting a new immediate needs and then planning for the future. Yeah. Um, clearly, there are there continue to be um, significant investments in the humanitarian sector to meet the, the huge needs across the country. And there's a clear need to protect that humanitarian sector and funding um, and to protect humanitarian space, both in terms of the funding, but also in terms of you know, actors being able to perform their duties as neutral, impartial humanitarian actors. But notwithstanding that, do you think that there is sufficient dialogue at the moment between the humanitarian sector and those working on recovery? Or do you think more needs to be done to harness, you know, the investments that are being made um, and, and to channel that towards effective recovery, be that, you know, systems, capacity um, that that's that will be left behind. Um, are we doing enough um, towards, I guess, what we call in a sector, the, the nexus? That's very important. So maybe we'll take reforms where civil society is not getting its say. Uh, and then uh, on humanitarian and recovery, do you see cooperation? Uh, and and uh, just to bring in one more theme that I think is hugely important, we didn't have time, maybe uh, Ina can uh, speak of that. It was from Oksana Potapova and Irina Kuznetsova from two uh, academic institutions here asking about consultations with displaced Ukrainians abroad. Because if we say, okay, 8 million are in Ukraine and 8 million are outside, surely if they want to come back, they want to have a say to what kind of country they are coming back. Maybe Ina knows something whether such effort is being made by whoever government or civil society at the moment. So we'll start. Maybe we'll go with Ina first and then finish in the room. Ina. Uh, okay, thanks. Uh, so uh, let me start with this uh, uh, question on the consultations and uh, uh, with displaced Ukrainians and abroad. This is indeed a, a, a very important question. And from we, what we are having is very mixed. So there are some efforts to get them involved. Uh, a lot of Ukrainians who are temporarily out of Ukraine are actually actively involved 
evolved, so they, they, they do participate. So we have we have the understanding of needs, we have some things happening, we do not have the holistic system and that is still needs to be made, uh, but there are already some things uh, which are in progress and uh, uh, we can build on those and uh, also see how to reach out to uh, uh, these Ukrainians so that they would uh, um, feel well that there's there, there's definitely a space for them and the role for them and want to participate uh, a related question it's about uh, uh, well sort of related question about the impact of diminished uh, workforce in uh, the civil society if I understood it correctly um, well indeed uh, a lot of civil society active active participants of the civil society uh, are moving between Ukraine and uh, uh, and other countries and uh, at some point civil society organizations especially if we are talking like early March uh, April May last year when it was extremely difficult for them to play to plan they needed to work in these divided teams they needed to adjust themselves well they did adjust i think most adjusted there are a lot of new people who came to the civil society also from other sectors and i find a lot of value in that because these people have brought together not just the activism but also connections and skills like from the it sector from the industry from also so it's a very dynamic sector so we uh um, do see many people coming and although the effects of these divided teams mm -hmm. are still seen and felt um, the civil society organizations are coping on the question of between the um uh, the relationship between the humanitarians the humanitarian sector and the recovery sector and how can be done more i actually see a lot of synergies and uh, especially at the local level, uh, addressing immediate recovery needs uh, feeds into uh, the humanitarian relief, because this is very much about how people feel safer, how they get the support and assistance they need. Obviously, uh, like in anything, more dialogue can be uh, useful, more can be done. I am sure that there is... Uh, uh, well, the, the people who work on the humanitarian tracks and those who work on recovery and development tracks uh, talk to each other. There are many overlapping, how we say, overlapping uh, uh, frameworks and networks and teams. We, uh, well, as a donor, we have supported a lot of humanitarian response by the civil society on a very practical grassroots community-based scale and we're also working with this uh, uh, the diversity of uh, actors on recovery and uh, I think this uh, dialogue is possible and necessary we are open to it thank, thank you, you Ina. Good this question is first opportunity to say thank you for all uh, countries all over the world who support Ukraine who solidar we uh, when I leave the country I don't have clothes I don't have even brush teeth and I live with my son and mom, and I'm grateful for Poland for this humanitarian aid. So it's very important. And uh, I'm very uh, grateful all citizens in hot, uh, in hot uh, place and also for Pin that um, communities and the NGOs bring different uh, humanitarian aid. So now we as a city probably we don't need humanitarian support, uh, like I mean uh, exactly right. AIDS, but we need psychological, I believe, support. We need rebuilding this, the, um, the residential complexes and also we need rebuild apartments of these people. So it's still uh, needed and we try, uh, we try to connect everyone who stakeholders in the field and not lose any of the contents. At the same time, I uh, want to admit uh, that uh, uh, me as a displaced person and uh, half of my team, they are displaced uh, person, they are or mothers or young women. And uh, we find ourselves as a like, kind of human capital and we want to rebuild our country and live in our country. That's why we are doing uh, what we can do being outside from different reasons, like being mothers or being needed to stay out because don't have where to come back, etc., etc. So I'm really grateful, Orisa, for this uh, fruitful conversation. 
conversation and important conversation. Well, we hope it will be a circular, you know, uh, economy or circular human capital where when you are outside, you learn all this, you know, establish new contacts, get new ideas to bring it back to your hometown. That is very inspiring. And I think it also gives you hope uh, exactly. for the future of Ukraine. Is this give me exactly when I don't know what who I am again being in Poland I ask what I can do and this humanitarian helps to others give me a chance to believe in me. Great. Olena. Yeah, if I can answer your question about uh, how civil society organizations are struggling, just an example of my organization, Anti-Corruption Action Center, we have around 25 people working with us, six of them are right now on the front lines fighting, three refocused of our activities mostly for the victory, because again, everything will be decided on the battlefield. We may speak about reconstruction, which is very important, but if we lose the state, we will have nothing to reconstruct. So we are advocating for tanks, fighter jets, and Larissa knows that uh, in the Olaf Scholz conference in Berlin, we were speaking about Leopard 2 tanks, trying to kind of engage Offer them. Offering him a t-shirt. Uh, offering, group. yes, him a t-shirt about tanks, Gepards, waiting Leopards in, in Ukraine. So it, it was also part of, the, of this uh, advocacy effort because that's uh, important. So uh, if you assess the capacity of my organization, who is working in a more closed environment right now because of the lack of transparency due to martial law. So we have almost two times uh, less people uh, working on watchdogging uh, reforms and all those things. With regards to the ministries, well, some are very open for cooperation, like for example, Ministry of, of Infrastructure or uh, Digitalization. Some are not that much, some areas are not that much open, but for years we managed to build our way there. This is law enforcement, judiciary. Uh, some from our perspective are absolutely not open as the Ministry of Energy, for example, because we were warning uh, about Russian plan Holodomor to destroy our energy system back in last spring. We were shouting out that we need to protect physically our system. And they said, hey, everything is fine. We are ready. Our gas yes, storages are uh, fine and we will go. We are absolutely ready for the winter and here is uh, the, the result for that uh, i cannot speak about ministries like agriculture because i have no idea we never tried to work with them because that was not our area but it depends a lot on the personalities of people so some governmental officials are very open some are not but still uh, could be uh, pushed into the cooperation some are dead end what about office of the president and yarmouk you know the answer. Your mind is not open for any cooperation with civil society. An office of the president is obviously the issue. That, that's one of the issues that also emerged in the survey I was referring to, where people said they are already rebuilding Ukraine, like Ina said, but they are not very happy with the level of um, cooperation. And mainly they attribute it to actual lack of political will to make this happen. We do hope that, you know, that this, there will be some breakthrough or um, in a way, perhaps it will start from the ground up. Perhaps, as I say, there will be this, uh, this movement mm -hmm. that will set uh, a certain practice in place, whereas, uh, you know, not everything comes from the top down. Uh, and uh, in Ukraine, actually, a lot of things are coming from the ground up. That way, it's so important what Irina does and what you all can contribute. We will be wrapping up. Uh, sincere apologies for those questions in here and also around the table that we simply could not take. But uh, I promise that this is just one of the series of conversations that we will be having with hopefully a specific, you know, suggestions, uh, lessons, policy ideas, uh, and, and just having this exchange going on. Uh, so I would like to uh, ask you to join me in the round of applause. So we really
our interpreter who enabled uh, our audience of more than uh, now 100 participants who are still staying with us to be able to listen to this in Ukrainian. Thank you very much to the UK Embassy who supports part of Ukraine Forum's work. And we'll be happy to feed in whatever information to the Ukraine Recovery Conference in June. And also a little announcement, we're gonna have uh, online tomorrow, a Ukrainian Minister of Foreign Affairs joining us to discuss multilateralism and Russian aggression. This will be followed by an expert discussion in Charmas as well. So if you can join us online, Please register if you want to join us in person. This is also an option. We will be in the big conference hall. Thank you so much for coming and come back soon. Thank you. Thank you.